Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. saved me, freed me from sin, that long had enslaved me, his precious blood he gave to redeem, now I belong to him, now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me. seated. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Norman Clayton wrote a lot of wonderful hymns, many of them in the Word of Life hymnal. Our text tonight is in the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 10. Very uh, interesting passage that we have before us tonight. We are looking at a transition in the book of Acts. Acts 10 moves us into that wonderful opening of the door by which most of us here have entered into the salvation relationship with Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10 is the opening of the door to the Gentiles. And last week we looked at Gentile obedience. We saw that God chose a very specific Gentile with whom to open the door. He chose a Roman, and not merely a Roman, but a leader of the Romans, a man who was actually part of the oppressing nation of Israel, and he was a Roman of the Romans. He was associated with the Italian band, a very elite group of crack troops that had come to Israel and were stationed at a very key city, a man that God was going to use because he was not only a leader among men, but he was a leader of his own family, as we saw last week. And God was going to bring him and his household and his friends in through the apostle to the Jews. A fascinating picture that we get so that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. So that now in the body of Christ we are one in him. And you recall the verses 5 through 8, it says, He received the vision, and then it says, Now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. We noticed that there were several very important basic principles which undergird this entire passage and which give us confidence that we as Gentiles are now welcomed into the body of Christ. The first principle that we learned here and why God chose this man Cornelius was he was a man who heard the entire message before he acted. Details are important with God and we noted that there were a good number of specific details 
in the passage. We noted also how important this is in relation to the doctrine of inspiration. If you and I would learn to be obedient to the will of God, we need to make sure that we understand not just the general ideas of the passages, but God wants us to hang on every word. Every word of God is pure. All inspiration, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. There is nothing in the entire Bible that is not profitable unto you for either doctrine, reproof, a correction, uh, in, a correction or instruction in righteousness, so that you can be perfect, a man who is completely fulfilled in that which God wants you to do. Every word of God is pure. That means the genealogical tables. That means those long passages in the Old Testament prophets that you don't quite understand. Every bit of it is inspired by God. All the things that sound sort of dull to us as we read them, those are all inspired by God, every word. There's a reason why God put it there. The second principle that we learned as we were looking through this, and we looked at many verses about that last week, was the second principle is immediate obedience is proof of faith. Cornelius was given specific details. He was told to send men, not a man. He was not told, go yourself. He was told to send men, so he sent men. He was told specific details about the man who was wanted, Simon, whose surname was Peter. He received information about the specific location with his coordinates at Joppa, Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, in a house. He was told that he would receive further instructions upon arrival. And that's why we came to the conclusion that immediate obedience is proof of faith. God gives you enough light for the path that you have right now. God expects us to obey the light that we have before he gives us further light. Most of us want to walk down the road a little ways before we really take our journey there. We want a little farther vision. We want some binoculars so that we can see what's around the bend, something like we used to have as kids, and you perhaps made one of these. It was a long square tube, and you put a mirror on one end at a 45-degree angle, and then you put a mirror on the other end at a 45-degree angle, and there was an opening in front of each mirror. So you could stick that thing around the corner, and you could look in the mirror here, see down the tube to the other mirror, and see around the corner. We want God to give us things like that. What God says is, walk to the corner, and then you'll see around the corner. Cornelius was a man who obeyed immediately, and that was proof of his faith. And we saw Jesus speaking of another centurion who likewise understood the principle of being under command, under authority, and obeying even if you don't understand all the instructions, but expecting to get further instructions the farther you go. Principle number three, immediate obedience is proof of submission to authority. Too often we want to be our own authorities as we walk through life, and we want to check out what God has told us to do before we do it. Principle number four was genuine faith requires and is always manifested by obedience, not just head knowledge. And we noted that our culture here in America does not like the concept of obedience because we're for individualism, we're for independence, we're for self-determination. But genuine faith requires and is always manifested by obedience, not merely head knowledge. And that's what brings us to our passage tonight, verses 9 through 16. On the morrow, as they went on their journey, this group that Cornelius has sent, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, God is doing something with another man. He's spoken to Cornelius, but if that was all he had done, we would find some resistance when those two household servants and that devout soldier arrived at the house of Simon the Tanner. Did you know that God always prepares the way when he gives you a command to obey? Even if it is a very reluctant target that you are aiming at, God will prepare the way. Now he's given us a specific command. He's told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
That covers us as a group. But it gets narrowed down a little bit when we get to Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and he gives some commands to some specific individuals. And as we move through the book of Acts, we discover that it is a commission given to each one of us. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What part of the earth has our Lord placed you in? Are you being his witness there. You say, but I don't know about that guy down. I mean, he looks pretty tough. He's a biker. He's got tattoos all over him. You know, uh, he's got a snarl on his face. And uh, I just saw him run over a dog and laugh. <laughs> Did you know God always prepares the way? God was going to prepare Peter's heart. He first spoke to Cornelius before he prepared Peter's heart. Peter's heart wasn't prepared at the time that the angel brought the message from God to Cornelius. But God would make sure that Peter's heart was prepared by the time that those three men reached the house of Simon the Tanner. Perhaps someone has been on your heart for a period of time. Perhaps you have felt a compulsion to witness to them. And everything you see about them says, man, you know, I'd really be scared to witness that person or that person is really going to resist me. I mean, I know they're just going to resist me. Do you think that God can prepare their heart as you obey? Obedience was in progress at the time that God prepared the heart of Peter. And here we find men obeying who are not yet even saved. And the man who is saved is the man who is going to put up resistance to the command of God. <laughs> Just the reverse of what we would anticipate. How interesting are the ways of God. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Do you notice something? Peter is engaged in spiritual activity. Peter is going up on the roof, not so he can stretch out and soak rays, not so he can get up on the roof and sort of survey the city, not so he can go up on the roof and you know, get away from the crowd down there and he don't want to talk to anybody anymore. Peter has gone up to pray. You know, the Lord often brings things to our minds as we're praying that we want to sort of shove away. As you enter into fellowship and communion with God, God will begin to bring things from the scripture to your mind. Did you know that as Peter was praying and saw his vision, God was bringing some things from the scripture to Peter's mind. We're going to see that in a second. In fact, some very specific and very vivid things God was going to remind Peter of and see if Peter would obey. We'll talk more of that in just a moment. He went up onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Ah, here's another key factor in this passage. Verse 10. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. Peter's praying and you know something comes and starts gnarling in his stomach. Here's his growling. Thinks, man, I am really hungry. Hard to pray when you're hungry, isn't it? Hard to pray when there's something distracting you. He says, well, Lord, you know, if you'd just excuse me for just a minute, I'd like to run down and get a bite to eat. God does something with him. He's very hungry, falls into a trance. Very powerful picture given to us here. He wanted to do something, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Hey, down there, rustle me up some grub. And as whoever's downstairs is trying to cook whatever, God pulls him into a trance. 
What happens while he's in the trance? He saw heaven opened. Now, you know, we find a number of places in Scripture where the heavens are opened. We find heaven opened on Mount Sinai where God speaks to Moses. We find heaven opened as the chariot of fire comes down and picks up Elijah to take him back. We find heaven opened in various other occasions, especially among the prophets in the Old Testament. We look at the book of Revelation and we see heaven opened on three or four occasions in the book of Revelation. Peter is getting a glimpse into heaven. Do you think it might be impressive to see what's there? John certainly did in the book of Revelation. He's overwhelmed and twice he falls down at the feet of the angel to worship the angel. The angel tells him, don't do it, worship God. He saw heaven opened. Now if you saw heaven opened, and you knew this is heaven opened, I suspect most of us would think, it's my time to go home. I'm being called up. <laughs> but the Lord didn't call up Peter. Instead, he let something down to Peter. And a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Now we see a similar situation to that where the men who had the paralytic came to Jesus and couldn't get to him through the crowd, so they went up on the roof, they tore a hole in the roof, and then they let the man down on his bed, which was sort of a, a mattress or a sheet or a cot of some kind, rolled up bedroll down in front of Jesus. Now, God is doing something with Peter. He's opened heaven. He's ripped off the roof, so to speak. He's lowering and is tied together at the corners, so it's being lowered by something, and it's full. It's a whole pallet full of unclean animals. We're in raw manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Four commands. Number one, get up. His trance, he was fallen flat. He's called by name. It's nobody else that's being spoken to here. He doesn't look at it and think, oh, that must be for that guy on the next rooftop over there. He's named by name. He's told what to do. This is not prepared food, which he wouldn't know whether or not it was kosher or not. This is living food. These are living animals. And he's told to take one and kill it. Now suppose you were there in Peter's place and this great sheet is coming down out of heaven and over the top of it you see a rattlesnake stick his head. And then a minute later, uh, here comes a, a big ugly baboon. And then a minute after that, you see a big sloppy moray eel flopping around up there. And then all of a sudden you see a turkey buzzard and you've just seen one of those, you've been driving across Texas and here's this roadkill and a bunch of turkey buzzards go flying away from the roadkill. And God says to you, okay, and he names you by name, get out of your car and go over there and grab one of those turkey buzzards, kill it, and eat it. <laughs> would you have a little bit of resistance? I think most of us would. Most of us would say, boy, I don't know what hit me just then, but man, I'm going to keep on driving. And drive around the dead road kill and watch the turkey buzzers as they flap off to the side of the road, or usually they just sort of hop off the side of the road, and then they hop right back, and they keep on chewing on that dead skunk or whatever it is in the middle of the road. How would you like it if it was a skunk that you saw hanging over the edge of that sheet? Boy, I tell you, Peter was revulsed at what he saw. But God had given him a command. I don't want you just to look at it. I don't want you to take pictures so you can put it in your scrapbook and say, look at this weird thing that I saw. I want you to kill something. Well, Peter might not have worried too much about killing it. But then God said, eat it. He didn't even say cook it first. He said, rise, Peter, 
kill and eat. I think most of us would have responded the same way that Peter responded. Now, we look back at Peter and criticize him because he's not obeying a command of God. Has God ever given you a command in his word that you really didn't want to obey? Has God ever placed a call on your life that you really didn't want to obey? I hope you can learn a lesson from Peter tonight. I hope I learn a lesson from Peter tonight. So that when we hear the call of God, and God is gracious, he repeats this command three times, we learn to obey. And we learn to apply the command that God gives. Because when God gives us a command, we are much too narrow-minded and narrow-focused whereby we say, well, I'll peek in the door, but I really don't want to go into the room. We'll discover here with Peter and with us that when God gives us a command, it's because he's opening a door for something far bigger and scarier. That's what happens to Peter here in this chapter. Let's go on with the text. Wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air, and there came a voice to him, Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. <laughs> he knows who's talking to him. He doesn't say, Not so, whoever you are up there, it must be the devil talking to me. He says, Not so, Lord. He recognized the voice. Peter had walked for three years with the master. He had heard everything that he said. As he walked with Christ, he knew the inflections. He knew the vocabulary. He knew the manner of speech. He knew the accent that Jesus would put on different words. He knows who is speaking to him. This same one, in just a couple of chapters before, had spoken to another man by the name of Saul. Saul of Tarsus, as he was on the road to Damascus. The Shekinah glory appeared, the heavens opened. Saul is struck down by light. A voice comes to him. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. The one who is the Shekinah dweller, the one who dwells in the heavens, the one who speaks from heaven, the one who speaks to us, is Jesus himself. Peter knew who it was. Peter had opened his mouth and inserted his foot on many occasions during the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter also opened his mouth for some good things when Christ walked with him on earth. But Peter hadn't yet learned his lesson of when I tell you to do something, don't argue with me, just obey. I've had to say that particular phrase to my children so many times. I'll tell them to do something, and I get this great big long explanation as to why it can't be done. Or a big long explanation about why I really shouldn't be asking them to do that, I should ask somebody else. And my response is, don't argue with me, just do what I tell you to do. I'm in charge, you're not. And here's our Lord speaking from heaven, opening heaven so Peter can see into heaven letting down this sheet with all these animals on it and giving Peter a command. You say, but it doesn't make sense. Well, you know, a lot of times those in authority give us commands that don't make a lot of sense to us. But our response is not to argue. And Cornelius understood that, an unsaved Gentile who has sent three men to find Peter. But Peter, a man who has walked with Christ, doesn't yet understand it. 
Not so, Lord. Now, if Jesus walked into this room and you knew that it was Jesus, and he walked up to you where you're sitting, and if Jesus walked up to you and you knew it was Jesus, and there was no question about it, it is Jesus. And he said, Keith, I want you to do such and such. What would the rest of you think if Keith said, not so, Lord. <laughs> we say, eh, he's carnal. Okay, how about if he walks up to you and he finds what your pet dislike is. Of course, he knows it now. And he tells you to do your pet dislike. Not so, Lord. Hey, you got the wrong guy. I'm not the man for this job. Do you understand what we're dealing with here? There is strong resistance to what Jesus has just told Peter to do. Not so, Lord. And then Peter gives his reason. I am a good Jewish boy. You know, I do it. The dietary stuff you told us to do in the Old Testament. I'm a good Jewish boy. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. <laughs> You're not going to make me do it now, are you? All this time I've kept the Jewish dietary laws. You mean i got to change? Seven last words of the church. We never did it that way before. That's seven words. I never did this before. Has God ever called you to do something you never did before? Has God ever made it clear that you are the one that's supposed to do it, not somebody else? Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The Lord Jesus is very patient with Peter. The voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. The second command, he gives him some information. Peter, everything you see in this sheet has been cleansed. Everything. God himself has cleansed it. Now, in the beginning, who was it that declared what was clean and what was unclean? It was God. God had made some separation between different kinds of animals. And God said, this batch over here is clean, and this batch over here is unclean, and I'm giving you a test of obedience here. Just like he had given a test of obedience to Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave a test of obedience to Israel. Clean animals, unclean animals. They didn't always keep it, but Peter looks at himself and he says, but I have always kept those commands. Peter, who made the animals? God did. Who divided the animals into clean and unclean? God did. If God wants to remove the barrier between clean animals and unclean animals so that they can mix between themselves and you can eat anything? If God does it, is it okay? Peter's struggling with that issue. The voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. You see, it suddenly is a conflict between the word of God and the word of Peter. Peter is still calling something unclean that God himself has cleansed. This was done thrice. What does that tell you? That means that Peter argued the second time. But Lord, did you really clean it? I mean, like, ooh, that gooey looking worm there. You mean I got to eat worms? What about the cockroach that just crawled over the edge of the sheet and is crawling down on the bottom side of the sheet? You mean I got to eat cockroach? 
cockroaches? <laughs> Sometimes I think the Lord has a sense of humor with us. I'm sure he showed Peter the things that were the very most revolting to Peter of all of the unclean animals. Because he was trying to teach Peter a very important lesson about people that Peter would have considered the most unclean of all of the Gentiles. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. God gave him three commands. Three times God said, Arise, Peter, kill, eat. Peter resisted even after God, in particular Jesus, told him it had been cleansed. Then God pulls the vessel back to heaven and closes heaven off. We're going to learn as we move next week, if the Lord allows me to be here, what Peter did at that point and how he meditated on why did God tell me to do this. Peter is hungry. Peter is waiting for lunch. Perhaps a chill went down his back and sweat poured off his forehead as he wondered, what are they cooking in the kitchen? <laughs> are they going to bring me something that now I'm going to have to eat it? Even though I'm starving. Look at this passage with me because Peter is being told to do something that he thinks is contrary to the word of God. Let me give you an illustration before we move on. Some of you may not believe this, but at one time I was a little boy. And when I was a little boy, I had a very practical mother. And... Um, Occasionally I would say something bad, maybe something I had picked up from the um, elders and deacons kids <laughs> and uh, as we were playing around. Perhaps I would have picked up a bad word or a bad attitude and I would say something sassy or naughty or some swear word that little kids have learned. My mother would hear me. She'd say, Chris, come over here. She grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and she said, your mouth is dirty. We're going to have to wash it out. And we're going to wash it out with soap. And she would drag me into the bathroom. She would take the soap, rub her hands together, pull my mouth open and stick the bar of soap in there and rub it around in my mouth until it was really clean. Take it out and make me spit out the soap. She said, there, now your mouth is clean. I don't want you to have a dirty mouth. I never forgot that. I certainly learned to fear the dirty mouth, we will clean it out routine. My mom didn't have to do that to me very many times before I began to learn to control my tongue. Regardless of what I heard, didn't mean it had to also come out of my mouth. Peter is afraid that he's going to get a dirty mouth. Before the flood, let's talk about the diets in the Bible, because you know God changed diets several times in the Bible. He changed the dietary laws, the dietary rules, several times in the Bible. Before the flood, people were strictly vegetarian. God had not given them the right to eat any kind of animals. Genesis 1.29 and Genesis 2.16. God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fr fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Before the flood, not only people, but animals were vegetarian. You say, me? Tyrannosaurus rexes? Yep. You know, it's been discovered that they can not only rip flesh with their fangs, 
but they also have the ability to eat herbs. Very interesting, some of the recent fossil finds. I don't know if you go on the website for the Institute for Creation Research. That is our home page. Whenever we turn on the computer, that's what comes up first, the ICR website. It is amazing what they've discovered. In fact, recently in China, they discovered a whole nest of eggs of sauropods which some of them were cracked open and the little baby dinosaurs were still inside and some of it was still protein. It had not calcified into rock. Fascinating, they found stomachs of dinosaurs that when cracked open had herbs, plant life in it. I'm sure you've all heard about the Tyrannosaurus named Sue, in which they found red blood cells inside the bone. Folks, that wouldn't be there if the earth were millions of years old. It would all be gone. Before the flood, God gave a specific diet to everything. It was green plants and their fruit. We find that stated again in Genesis 2:15 through 17. The Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Man prior to the flood, was vegetarian. God changed the diet after the flood, but did you know that God prepared man for a change in diet by dividing the animals into clean animals and unclean animals before the flood? Genesis 7, 8. Let me read you the context. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and his female, to keep alive seed upon the face of the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him, and Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. That meant all the bugs that later on they weren't going to be able to eat. There went in two and two into the ark unto Noah in the ark, the male and the female as God commanded, Noah. Then we move after the flood and God actually changes the diet after the flood. He adds meat to their diet in Genesis chapter 9 verses 1 through 4. God blessed Noah and his sons and he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given it you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. God gave them the right to eat meat, anything that moves, right after the flood. He gave them only one restriction. He told them, you can't eat it with its blood. He explains that to us in Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The nephesh, the life of the flesh, a word translated soul many times in the Old Testament. 
You want to know when somebody is dead and somebody is alive? It's when the blood begins to coagulate because the life of the flesh, the soul of the flesh, is in the blood. Too often in modern medicine today, they're trying to wait for the brain waves to go flat for a minute, and if they do so, then they rip the guy open, take out his organs, transplant them into somebody else, and make a million dollars. Too often nowadays, they say, well, you know, his heart has stopped beating, and um, he has a DNR, so we're not going to bring him back. So therefore, we can do with his body whatever we want it to do. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. It says it here in this passage too. Did you just read it? But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. You see, God had some very special purposes for blood, especially with clean animals, because I was going to portray for us what would happen with Jesus on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But God added to their diet at this point by allowing them to eat everything. All the stuff that later under Jewish dietary law they couldn't eat, now God said you can eat it. So all the way from the time of Noah as he exited the ark, all the way down to the time that God gave the law to Mount Sinai, uh, to Moses on Mount Sinai, and delineated what could be eaten and what could not be eaten, that entire period of time, they were free to eat everything. But now we find another dietary change when he brought Israel out of Egypt. A dietary change that Peter is now thinking about as he sees that sheet being let down out of heaven. Peter was a Jew. He feared having the dirty mouth he believed in the strict dietary laws. Now, as we read these things, some of them, probably if we thought about eating those things, it would not make us very happy. You're not required to eat them, but you're free to eat them. God didn't tell Peter he had to kill everything in the sheet and eat everything in the sheet. God just said, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter was hungry. Hey, you need a lunch? Everything here is okay. You know, the entire smorgasbord is available to you, and it's fresh. <laughs> so listen to this. Here we find Leviticus chapter 11. God is going to give dietary laws now for Israel to show them that they are a separate people. Remember, all the Gentile nations around them, including the Egyptians, where they have just come out. When they were in Egypt, they didn't have the dietary laws. When they were in Egypt, they were eating everything that the Egyptians ate, if they could get their hands on it. While they were out there in Abraham and his family, I mean, they ate all kinds of stuff. They didn't have the Mosaic law yet. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob ate whatever was available. They probably had a piece of camel every now and then. People today still eat camels. Did you know that? We think of it, oh, that's that funny-looking animal that either you've got a camel with one hump or a dromedary and you've got two humps on it and that should make it a lot easier to ride the thing and you can get across the desert and they store water in those humps. And People eat camels in North Africa today. That was one of the unclean animals, but Abraham would have had access to them. Hey, good as a cow. Did you know people eat horses? Hey, in France, it's a delicacy. Did you know you could have horse meat? Now, I know my daughter doesn't want to hear this. She loves horses. But, uh, hey, people kill horses and eat them. That's an unclean animal. Because it doesn't meet the qualifications that God gave for clean animals in the text. The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. God is going to make a division on what is clean and what is unclean. They already knew that from the flood. But they were eating everything because God said you can eat everything. But now God's going to say now, you know what's out there? You've had the taste of some of those other things, like you probably enjoyed your ham while you were in Egypt, your pork sausage, your tailor ham. You know, your bacon, the pork chops. 
Well, some of the parts of pigs I'm not interested in eating that some cultures do eat, but you can't eat it anymore. You know, that would put a crimp on some of our breakfasts, wouldn't it? Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven hooded and cheweth the cud among the beast, that shall you eat. That means cows are okay. That means sheep are okay. That means goats are okay. Those things that chew the cud, that's okay. But whatsoever, nevertheless, these you shall not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof as the camel because he cheweth the cud, but he divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divideth the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean unto you. Of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. They are unclean to you. Don't want you to get tempted. You got hold of this little porker and he's squealing there and you begin to smell the smell of, you know, a baked ham and you think back to Egypt. Hey, you're not even supposed to touch him. Of their flesh shall you not eat and their carcass shall you not touch. They are unclean unto you. Okay, they're the animals. Now let's talk about water. These you shall eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, them ye shall eat. So whatever body of water these things live in, you can eat it if they have fins and scales. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that moveth in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. Things like eels. You know, eels are a delicacy. Sharks have got skin, but they don't, and they have fins, but they don't have scales. Can't eat shark. Boy, I remember eating a good Mako shark steak many years ago. Couldn't eat that. You know, there were some seagoing dinosaurs that had skin and not scales. Now, that would fill your freezer for more than a year but you couldn't eat it. In fact, very interesting, recently the Institute for Creation Research reported on the discovery of what the people excavating a dinosaur thought was just a, a flake of stone, and as they looked at it more closely, they realized it wasn't stone. It was not just an impression of dinosaur skin. It was actually a piece of dinosaur skin. Folks, if that were 175 million years old from the Jurassic period, it would not have been skin anymore. Those were creatures that were still alive on earth and God is giving them commands about all these things while people were still on earth. It's in the sea, but it doesn't have scales. It's got fins, but it doesn't have scales or it has scales and doesn't have fins. You can't eat it. All that have not fins and scales in the sea and in the rivers and all that move in the waters and of every lineage thing that was in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. That leaves out crabs and lobsters and shrimp and scallops. I love scallops. All of that good stuff. It was forbidden to the Jews. Oysters, some people like oysters, some don't. My mom used to love oysters. I shiver about the thought of swallowing raw oysters, but some people do it. You know, I guess that makes you brave if you do that. They shall even be an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever has no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. And these are they which you shall have in abomination among the fowls. So he says, okay, we've talked about land animals. We've talked about what moves in the seas, all those sea creatures. Now let's talk about birds. God's very systematic, very careful as he goes through here. These are the ones you can't eat. They're an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind. Every raven after his kind. You wonder what Elijah thought as the ravens were feeding him by the brook. He thought, oh man, why didn't God choose some kind of an other bird? 
But at least I'm not eating a raven. It just is carrying stuff to me. And the owl. When was the last time you had a good plate of owl? And the nighthawk and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind and the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the swan and the pelican and the gear eagle and the stork and the heron after her kind and the lapwing and the bat. I'm definitely out when it comes to bats. All fowls that creep going upon all fours. So he goes through also flying things first. Shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these you may eat of every flying, creep, uh, flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all fours, which have legs above their feet, that's like grasshoppers, and leap withal upon the earth. Even these of them you may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. I hear somebody out there saying amen, all the beetles. <laughs> the beetle after his kind. Last time you ate a beetle. But all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. For, and for these you shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. And whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. That means that if you stomped on a bug and you had to sweep it up and clean it up, you were unclean for the rest of the day. Folks, this is a tough law to keep. The carcass of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cud, are unclean unto you. Every one that toucheth them shall be unclean. Whatsoever goeth upon his paws. That means your cats and your dogs. Now there are certain cultures that, you know, love to walk their dog. <laughs> uh, they'll cook them and eat them. When was the last time you had a piece of cat meat? How about eating lions and tigers? Whatsoever goeth upon his paws, all manner of beasts shall go on all fours. Those are unclean unto you. Whosoever toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until even. He that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until even. They are unclean unto you. Something dies in your yard. Or you, something jumps across the fence and wants to get it, uh, your sheep and you kill it. And you've got to drag it out. You're unclean until evening. Upon whatsoever any of them which are dead doth fall, it shall be unclean, whether it be any vessel of wood or raiment or skin or sack or whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put in water, and it shall be unclean until evening, so it shall be cleansed. So you've got a lizard hanging on the ceiling, it dies and drops into your pot. Every earthen vessel wherein to anything of them falleth, whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and you shall break it. I just bought it down at Walmart. Of all meat which may be eaten, that on which such water cometh shall be unclean, and all drink that may be drunk in any such vessel shall be unclean, and everything whereupon any part of the carcass falleth shall be unclean, whether it be oven or ranges for pots, they shall be broken down, for they are unclean, it shall be unclean unto you. Can you imagine that? You just bought a brand new oven. And here's something like a mouse gets into it and dies in the oven. What do you got to do? You got to throw the oven away. You've got to break it down, it says. Then he goes on and explains if it's running water, it's not a problem, and so on. If it falls on sowing seed, uh, uh, which is to be sown, that'll be clean. But if it's on seed that you're going to have to eat, it's unclean. It, I mean, he gives you an incredible amount of information. We go down here a little farther, down to verse 41. Every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, like snakes. Whatsoever goeth upon all four, or whatsoever hath more feet, um, more feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, millipedes, centipedes, and things like that. Them you shall not eat. I think you might have agreed with that. Uh, you shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them that you should be defiled thereby. And God gives the reason in verse 44 and following. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, for I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Which, of course, is quoted in the New Testament as a command for us to be holy. Do you understand why Peter had a problem? 
as he looked at this sheet that was being let down from heaven? God has not just given a general idea, you know, anything that looks sort of bad to you and that you sort of get an upset stomach over, you know, avoid those kinds of things. It might not be good for your health. God says, the reason I'm making a difference here is because you are going to be a separate and distinct people from the Gentiles, out of whom I am severing you. You are going to be a holy nation unto me. And this is the way you're going to be able to tell it. One of the visible external signs, whereas before you were with the Egyptians, whereas before you ate anything that was there, and I, I said it was okay all the way back to the days of Noah, it was okay, but now I'm telling you, you as the Jewish people are going to be separate and distinct in what you can eat and what you cannot eat. And he gives other rules too, like what you can wear and what you cannot wear, and how you cannot mix certain types of cloth together and so on. Because God says, I want you to understand the doctrine of separation. You've got it on the wall back there. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not that thing which is unclean, and I will be unto you a God, and you shall be my people. It brings back memories of these passages, but God now has a more direct separation for us. Not merely in what we eat, but in who we are, how we live, the moral code that God has given to us as we are empowered by the Spirit of God to live for Him. Deuteronomy 14, he starts off with that reason in verse 2, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations upon the earth. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. And he goes on and he gives you the same list that we find over in Leviticus chapter 11. Now that's the background for Peter on top of the roof in Acts chapter 10. God prepared Peter by making him hungry. He wanted to burn this like a branding iron into Peter's mind when Peter remembered this situation. Would Peter really hold to the principle? Would the lesson that God is about to teach him make an impact? Would the lesson change his life? Dear folks, that's what God does with us. God designs to change our life. We've been going along, feeling very comfortable, running down the groove that we've worn by going over it and 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 over it, back and back and back and again. And suddenly God says, I want you to step up on the edge of the groove and I want you to start walking a little farther out from that circle that you're going around and going around and going around and going around. And perhaps when you step off, instead of going in a circle, I'm going to put you on a tangent, a straight line to a destination that you do not yet know. And we say, but Lord, I've always done it this way. And I thought I was obeying your word. I thought I was doing what you told me to do. There are many people sitting in churches today who think they're doing what God told them to do because they have not been like Cornelius, who was a detailed man. Cornelius, a man who had learned to be under authority and to do what he was told, even when it didn't actually make sense to him, and even when he didn't have full information yet. It shall be told thee, it shall be told thee, what thou must do. Obey the small instructions, and you will find that God gives you deeper and more in-depth instructions later on. When God says something once, it's enough. When he repeats it three times to overcome our resistance, we had better pay attention. Something else that strikes me as I look at this passage here with Peter on the roof, God uses illustrations and object lessons to teach the application or truth to specific life principles. Think about the parables of our Lord. Think about the new birth and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He uses something that Nicodemus is familiar with, natural birth, to explain to him spiritual birth. Think about the woman of Samaria at the well and the living water. Jesus used something that was familiar to her to teach her something far beyond what she had ever comprehended. 
The illustrations, and this is very important, the illustrations are always true that are used to teach truth. There are people who don't like what happened in Acts chapter 10, and they say, well, you know, we really still are under the dietary laws of the Old Testament. I mean, I'm talking about Christians, real people who really have trusted Christ, but they still feel uncomfortable and they want to be back under those dietary laws. And so they make sure that they don't eat any of those things, although they probably miss a few because those are pretty comprehensive laws. And so they argue that the illustration was false and that God did not really want for Peter to break the dietary laws, but God used a lie to teach the truth. Folks, that is an argument against the character of God. If Peter had jumped up and grabbed one of those animals, chopped off its head and swallowed it down, he would have been okay. God does not use lies to teach the truth. What God hath cleansed is not a hypothetical situation. It is an actuality. It is a statement from Jesus himself. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common nor unclean. Now we know later in the passage that God is going to stretch Peter's mind even farther, farther than the Jewish dietary laws. He's going to stretch it to the issue of Gentiles, which for a a, a believing Orthodox Jew, those were the most unclean creatures on the face of the earth, far worse than worms. They called Gentiles dogs. God never uses a lie to teach the truth. But you know, Peter later on fell back into his old ways. He had to be rebuked. Galatians chapter 2, we were in the book of Galatians this morning talking about the distinctions between law and grace and faith and works. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and following. Paul tells us something that happened with Peter later on. When Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Perfectly okay. That was made clear back in Acts chapter 10. But when they came, that is James from Jerusalem with other Jewish Christians, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He suddenly became a people pleaser. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Even Barnabas, the guy with the really level head, even he was carried away with it. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the gospel sets you free from the law, folks. I hope you got that from the message this morning in the sermon. It doesn't mean you can live an immoral life. It means that now you have a new empowerment and a new motivation to live a holy life. Not the restrictions of the law, but the indwelling spirit of God and your love for Jesus Christ. Love is always more powerful than law. What the law could not make you do, true love for Christ will always make you do. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, he's calling him down in front of the rest, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? See, there was the pressure from the Judaizers to force the Gentiles into the Jewish mold. And God had said, I've, I've already released you from the mold of Judaism. I have brought you into the freedom of the gospel. What we've gone back to is what it was like before the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. What we've gone back to is what I gave the right to Noah immediately following the flood. Now, it might have been a shock to Noah and his family to eat animals. They might have had some resistance to that. It was no doubt a shock to the Israelites when they suddenly got a restriction on the diet that they hadn't had before. But they got used to it. And so, 1,400 plus years later, Peter is suddenly getting another change in diet. 
This has happened before. You know, he doesn't think back to Noah, he thinks back to Moses. And now there are those who don't want those changes in their dietary laws. They've trusted Christ, but they are, because they're stubborn, they are going to stay with the old dietary laws, and these Gentiles had better do it too. Paul rebukes Peter, the one who had the vision, who knew the truth, who actually was the one who brought Cornelius into the body of Christ, suddenly because of Jewish pressure from guys from Jerusalem, now he wants to go back to the old ways, the proselytizing ways, back to the old ways where a man had to become a Jew before he could enter the presence of God. If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, not sinners of Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Dear folks, that's the heart of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. Paul says it in Galatians. He says it in Romans. He quotes Habakkuk 2.4. We find it in the book of Hebrews. This is key to the Christian faith. If there's any question, we can go to the direct doctrinal teaching of the Apostle Paul. And we see where that kind of teaching which tries to drag you back under the dietary laws comes from. 1 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. The faith is that body of truth once and for all delivered unto the saints. It's that body of truth for which we are to contend according to Jude and 1 Peter. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, now here's where the false doctrine comes from, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, daimonion, demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and listen to what they're going to teach. Forbidding to marry, remind you of the celibacy of the Roman Catholic priesthood, and commanding to abstain from meats, well, that has changed now in Rome, but it used to be Friday you could only eat fish. Commanding to abstain from meats, listen, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Peter didn't want to have a dirty mouth. But you see, God had washed it so there's no way that it would give him a dirty mouth. And that was the object lesson, which is a true object lesson, just exactly like natural birth was the object lesson for Nicodemus. The water at the well was the object lesson for the woman of Samaria. God gave Peter an object lesson, and it was a true object lesson. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common, nor unclean. And that is the foundation upon which you and I, as Gentiles, can be joined to the body of Christ without distinction from those who had the covenant promises under Moses in the Old Testament without distinction we become one in Christ. If the object lesson is not true, how then could it be that the practical application of that object lesson would be true? How we rejoice that every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. 
for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power. And you are God. You can do whatever you want whenever you want it. And as we see throughout Scripture, there were times that you set markers specifically as tests for different groups of people. You gave them for purposes, in the case of the dietary laws, to set your people apart as holy and distinct from the Gentile nations around them, to teach them to learn obedience even when they didn't understand it, to teach them that someday, though they did not yet know it, you were going to once again bring Gentiles into that group of men and women of faith who could be in fellowship with you. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts. Help us to understand its application, its truth, and the joy that we have because of the grace of God and the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.